This is part two of a lecture series where we are focusing on the basics of genetics and it's part of a larger genetics lecture series about Mendelian genetics. Now in the previous video we talked about the idea of what is a gene, the basic structure of genetic information and how those structures actually become a look which we call phenotype which is determined based on a genotype which is a specific combination of genes that you get after you combine what you get from your mom with what you combine from, get from your dad. Now we also talked about the fact that this specific phenotype actually becomes from the relationship between what these genes tell you to be and what the environment tells you to do. So that sometimes the environment can activate or deactivate the expression of the gene. We also talked about the fact that phenotype is a word for physical, pH, phenotype, pH. It's an expression for the physical characteristics which are basically a product of the proteins that you are secreting or expressing. And that these proteins come from the genes. Remember, genes, the particle of inheritance, which is also understood as the smallest particle of the DNA code which determines a protein. Which gene is active is going to determine who you are. For example, we all, all our cells have exactly the same genetic information in them. But they are different because they are expressing different genes. And therefore, that proves that the gene expression or how the genes are open or close to, to actually producing the proteins changes who we are. And so the environment can also do the same and change the genetic code. But remember that you were born with a code and that this code more often than not is going to determine your look depending on what the environment tells you to do. And that is what we call the phenotype. Uh, now, what we didn't talk about is how this phenotype actually works. How does the code become... Uh, determines the phenotype. Now, in a future tap chapter, we're actually going to talk about the process by which the code is translated and becomes the phenotype. How does the gene go from the genetic code in the DNA to the actual protein in the cell in a process that we call protein synthesis? But what I mean by now is that what part of you uh, that came from mom and came from dad tells you to be one way or the other? Why do you have a large nose instead of a small nose? So, is that, and, and so forth. Now, we talked about the fact that you get genes from mom and genes from dad and that you can get different versions of these genes called alleles. Now, what Mendel figured out after painstakingly doing years of analysis of, of the pea growth and looking at seven different traits is that sometimes it seems like one trait overpowers another. Now, I'm sure that you've been, been in situations like this when you ask your mom for something and you ask your dad for something. And when you ask mom, your mom says, sure, uh, do this. But dad says, no, don't. And then what, who do you follow? When you get two conflicting messages, what do you do? Well, usually you do what the most dominant of parents in that situation was. And so more, a lot of times they say the same thing, but sometimes they don't. And that is the idea what we're talking about. Now, this idea of dominance basically means that when you have a, a book that talks about something, like an earth-based science book, have you ever had a situation when one book is better than another? Maybe you are assigned two books about exactly the same thing, but you prefer to use this book for space or this book for geology, but neither book is good, is better for both. So depending on the character, one might be stronger than the other and so forth. The same way with the genes. Maybe my dad said, please have blue eyes. But my mom says, you've got to have brown eyes. And since the brown eye gene is more expressive, more strong, strong sorry, stronger than the blue gene, the brown overpowers the blue. Now, that's actually a simplistic way of looking at eye color. I talked about that in the first video. And I talked about the idea that eye color is actually what we call a polygenic trait that has many, many variations. So many variations because eye color is actually determined by multiple genes. And we're going to talk about that later too. But if it was determined by only one gene, basically the easiest way to understand it is that Blue eye color is only ever going to happen if all you have is uh, genes that say blue. In other words, both the genes, the one you got from mom and the mom you got from dad, say you need to have light color eyes. If the mom you, gene you got from dad says brown eyes, or the gene you got from mom says brown eyes, even if you have a blue eye gene, you're not going to have blue eyes because the brown overpowers the, the blue. 
And this idea of dominus is also displayed on that picture I showed you before with the flowers. That you have a red flower and a white flower. The white flower is only going to be white if both alleles, both versions of the gene that determines the trait or no, sorry, the character for flower color is are saying you need to express the white trait. Meanwhile, you can be red by either having two genes saying please be red. Or if you have one copy of the book saying be red and the other one copy saying be white, the red overpowers the white. And this is what we call dominance. The one that is only expressed if by itself or by paired up with another like itself is called a recessive. The one that's always expressed when present we call dominant. And that is the basics of how this code actually works. Now what that means, and this is the beauty that made Mendel finally solved his problem with the flowers. And we're going to talk about in, a, in another video about how he solved that problem with flowers that we talked about in the previous video. But he understood that the root of the problem was that there was two ways of being dominant. You can look dominant by being having two copies of the dominant gene or by having a copy of the dominant gene and a copy of the recessive gene. Either way, you look the same. So while you have two different genotypes, the phenotype is the same for big B, little b, than it is for big B, big B. Both of those will give you brown eyes. Meanwhile, little b, little b will give you blue eyes. So there's two ways of looking dominant, but only one way of looking recessive in this example. Now remember that the environment can also play with this like we talked about. Now the study of how these traits work how they are passed on, the structure of the gene, how genes copy themselves, how genes become proteins, and how genes are work and evolve is called genetics. And because of genes. But remember that Mendel never actually used the term genes. He called them factors. It was until later when Mendel's work was rediscovered that we started using the idea of genes. Now, when we do genetics, we have to do a lot of uh, it's a lot of things. So as you see here what we talked about you, have, you go all the way from Mendel to modern genetics, which is trying to use advanced technology to actually understand and decode the human genome and seeing how we are close or different from each other and, and all of that. We also learn about the structure, both the molecular structure of the DNA, double helix, and the chromosomes. We learn about how these traits are passed on and also how they play with the evolution process. And you see here a pedigree, which talks about how the traits get passed on. And so... All of these things we're going to talk about as we go through this genetics unit and in the topic. Now, when you do genetics, you have to do a lot of things with probability. Probability is the chances of a certain event happening. Now, um, later in the quarter, I'm actually in, in the part in, the, in this uh, video series, I'm actually going to go into the, uh, explain to you what actually means what I actually mean by this this series. Uh, by, by probability. I'm going to do probability problems and teach you how to do everything. But for now, I want you to understand the basics. When you flip a coin, you can either get heads or tails, right? So that means that either you're going to get a one or, or a tail. So what is the chances of you getting a tail? Well, what are the possibilities? There's two possibilities, heads or tails. So there are two chances. So given the chances, what is the probability of getting heads? One half. What about with a die? If I roll a die, what is the probability of getting a 1? Well, there are six possible events. And I want a specific event, which is getting a 1. So the chance of getting a 1 is 1 out of 6. And that's pretty much how it works. The basics of probability. And so we're going to be talking about this in more detail and how to actually use probability to use uh, problems. So those of you who like math, genetics is good because of that, because there's some math in genetics. But remember that probability is going to be important, and I hope you understand that basic concept at this point, because you're going to need that uh, to understand what's coming up next. Now, another thing you need to understand in genetics is the idea of parents versus offspring. Now, when I use the word parents, I obviously mean the ones which are doing the crossing, doing the sex, to actually create the children. Now, there's formal words for this. Parents are also called progenitors because they come before, they generate, genitors. They are the ones that generate the genes. So the progenitors are the ones that came before you actually have the, the, the children. Now, the progeny 
is what comes out of the progenitors. I'm not sure, I don't know if you know about this, but in science fiction, they sometimes refer to the progeny of the aliens. That's like all those little things coming out of pods. So if you ever play uh, a game like this, like a, a space a space sh shooter, you probably know about these progeny that comes out of these pods. And that's what it is. It's the offspring. It's another word. Offspring is the people that come out. So in this, in this example here, you see that there's two purple flowers crossing to make several different kinds of flowers. So these flowers here is what we called the progenitors or parents of this cross. And this, these are what we call the offspring, the children, or the progeny of these crosses. Now, we also know how this works. Remember that the way that actually works is that the parents, when they cross, for example, here you see a uh, green pod mixing with the white pod, making all green pods. So you have the progeny and the progenitors in, in featured. Now we know that the way this actually happens is that each parent does meiosis to create a gamete that has half of the information of each parent, which then gets sent to a gamete. This gamete combines with another parent's gamete to a process called fertilization, which then restores a whole which is the new organism, which is how you can possibly get from two different things, one thing. So, um, for example, so this is the steps again. Meiosis create the gametes. Now you're going to get one gamete from a parent and one from another. These gametes will add together to a process called fertilization to actually make something that is fusing the nucleuses of both parents. So you went from a 2N that was each parent, and this is going to happen in each parent, to make an N cell that was the gamete. Now, each gamete is an N. So when you combine those two Ns in the process of fertilization, you again restore diploidy on a 2N cell. And so that is how that actually works. So gametes, fertilization, make zygotes. Now, in genetics, one way to actually solve genetic problems, and we're going to be doing this all over the next video, is to use a device that is called the Punnett Square. Now, the Punnett Square was actually invented by a scientist called Punnett. And you see him featuring the picture here. He actually worked with butterflies, and he wanted to look at the color patterns of butterflies and how the butterfly patterns were carried from generation to generation. So he did much of the same thing Mendel did, but he actually developed a system to calculate the probabilities of Mendelian crosses without actually using math. And so we call that the Punnett square. And it actually mimics what's happening in meiosis. Basically, you get one organism which has two uh, genes. And then you, those genes are going to separate to form the gametes. Each gamete will get, gets one copy of that gene. And it may not necessarily be the same copy. And, and then the gametes of one parent combine with the gametes of another parent to make a new organism. But notice that if you have parents with different kinds of gametes, you can also make different kinds of genetic codes or genotypes, which can in turn become different phenotypes or, or actually physical characteristics or traits. And so we're going to be talking about how that works and what is a Punnett square and how to use them in, the, in our next video. But I also wanted, wanted to, I wanted to remind you guys that this process of genetics, now we understand that meiosis and mitosis have everything to do with how sexual production takes place. But when Mendel did this, we knew nothing about meiosis. And we knew nothing about DNA. So he figured out all of these things about these factors, which were later called genes, on his own. He, he, he hypothesized the existence of this particle. Now we understand that when he's talking about the parents creating gametes, that actually is meiosis. Now we understand that when he talks about the, parent, the gametes rejoining, that's fertilization. Now we understand that the new organism, which is a new code, is a zygote that grows to be who we are through mitosis. But all of these things are things that came later, and so Mendel did not have this basic understanding. But as we go through the, the next lecture video, and we talked about the different things Mendel did to figure out this whole system, make sure you understand that the processes of meiosis and mitosis can be explained or can explain what Mendel was actually seeing. And so tie, try to tie that in to what the process you learned in the previous topic when we did cell division. So on the next video, we're going to talk about the crosses that Mendel did to discover this process of how things work, which I've been explaining in this last two videos.